Hi there, Robin. Good morning, good afternoon, TGIM. Thank goodness it is Monday. I like that. Seven days a week. It's a cool thing. All right, let's get rolling along here. There's the dollar index. You can see the dollar backing off a little bit more. You know, we keep on uh, wondering when this thing is going to finally, you know, reach, recede a little bit. I mean, they've been buying the dollar and buying the dollar. They just don't seem to have anywhere else to go. It's it's odd. Um, I guess it's just part of the process and the end result. So, you see there, and what do we have it over here on the Chicago Quant? Same thing. You can see, well, actually, it's kind of unched here. It's unched from, uh, from Friday and maybe even a little bit higher. Uh, but you can see it's been in daily sell since this little slide there and it hasn't exactly followed the rule in the sense of uh, on the daily. It normally, you know, would uh, you know be down, wouldn't have that gap right there. That's for sure. It would have been just cruising along this way. It has stayed steady, but it's still below where it kind of went into the daily sell. But at the same time, the true rule of all is trying to match up the daily with the weekly. And there you go. It says basically uh, it's been in a weekly buy now three weeks. And so you couldn't take that short. You just were just neutral. That's all you were is neutral. So you still have the the bullets to fire in the end. That's what it comes down to. Um, you know the dollar overall. You know there's talk of bricks again. I have a friend that's just constantly trying to tell me that the bricks are going to do something positive. I don't see how South Africa, China, Russia, and 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 I like to divert. Brazil and India to the side of those th other three, uh, you know, where law and order doesn't seem to have much of an effect. Um, unfortunately, South Africa seems to be, you know, since, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, I guess, uh, was it not Robert Mugabe? That's Zimbabwe, uh, Rhodesia. Um, uh, you know, since uh, the change of uh, leadership in, in the uh, South African country all these decades now, it hasn't grown. It seems to have just gone sideways down. So I really have my doubts that the BRICS can figure out what day it is, let alone actually have a reserve currency. Can you imagine putting your money in, uh, in something that's backed by China, Russia, and South Africa? You could, like I said, you could throw the other two in, Brazil and India, but... They just kind of pulsate along, but the bricks, I, I just don't see it. But I keep on hearing about it, and I kind of shake my head at it. Sound. No sound? I hear me. I hear me talking. So, maybe it's you? Let me just uh, give you a ring on the old telephone here. And see what you're talking about. Just a double, 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 double check. Double, double, triple check. Let's see, where's that telephone? Telephone. And there we are. So, yeah, it's it's a hard thing to believe that the bricks could actually do anything that would be competent. You don't hear me? Oh, okay, good. Okay. Ta-ta. So, um, at this point, let's take a look at, say, the Swiss. I think the Swiss has been acting pretty good lately. So, let's just check her out. Let's see. Right there. I just saw it. There it is. Swiss. There's the dollar Swiss Paris trade. And it has been gaining against the dollar, as you can see there. In many ways, it's kind of funny. It looks like the... Uh, the dollar index, this the Swiss dollar pairs trade, you know, moving down like that. And so when when the when the uh, Swiss is going down, it's gaining against the dollar, and uh, you know less Swiss to the dollar. So it's a it's a win win. And you can see here the dollar index looks a lot like that too. Now let's jump over to the Swiss on the J4X and see what it looks like. Right there. Metho two thousand. Sounds a okay. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, I gave Robin a call just to confirm that. I was like, because I can hear. I I am on here on. Uh, I think I'm on using Chicago Quant. 
actually, yeah, I'm almost sure of it. I'm on the Chicago Quant spot. So yeah, I could say hi, too. <laughs> hi. There we are. If I can figure out where to push the button. I want to say something. So where can I say something? No, no, I don't want to do that. I just lost myself. I hate that. We'll find my way back to there again. But, uh... So you can see there the, the action in the Swiss. And I'm sure the, the Euro was kind of a little bit more passive, of course. You know, it's been bouncing in and out. But you can see the Swiss is in a cell now for three weeks. So that automatically uh, says something to me. And that's pretty much where it comes down to, too, in the end. Why is this thing doing this to me? All it wants me to do is open up a channel. Create a channel to join a chat. What do you mean, create a channel to join a chat? What is this? All I want to do is say hi. Hmm. It is torturing me. Maybe I'm not signed in. Maybe that's what it is. You know, that's, that's, that's sometimes what it comes down to. Subscribed. I am subscribed. So let's check out the Euro and see what the Euro is doing here. There it is, right there. It's been marching up against the dollar. That means it's gaining in value also. And right there, we uh, fell, we're falling through the... We were in a weekly buy for the last two weeks, and now it's pressing down. So now it is higher today, and it's been in the daily buy since there. So or No, right there, right before it. Right there. So it's been a daily buy for this nice little move. But this action here is a tad surprising. Really keep on thinking that the euro is going to get its act together. You know, I keep on thinking the second largest economy in the world, you know, European Union, you would think that somehow or another they could get this game working just right. If nothing else, they've got to hire the uh, marketing company that runs the Chinese government. Or the government, the Chinese government hires a, this must have some marketing company for them to try to convince the world that they're the second largest economy when they're not even close. That's what Europe needs. They need to remind people that they're the second largest economy. Let's see. <laughs> All right. So from there, I guess what we'll do is check out the cable. The cable, cable, cable. Put it up on J4X. Right there. Wow, real sideline. You know, we talked about this last week. The cable. It was really tight, like the way the dollar was. You know, just waiting and waiting and waiting. And you can see it there. They are just stalled out. Look at that. Real flat line. Just like the dollar index. Let's just go back to the dollar index and point it out clearly like so. Bing. Real sideways action. It is curious. The uh, oh, and you can see here it's trying to get into a daily sell. It's been in a buy and it uh, is now... You know, it's right at the edge. And we've been in that long slide weekly cells now since the 130-ish area, 131 area. We went into the weekly sell up in here, or 133, 34 area. Whatever. Oh, no, we don't want to move that. No moving that. Let's put that back in spot right there. There we are. Yeah, 131 area like that. So, you know, it's fallen as low as uh, was at 122 ish and now we're back playing with the uh, no 120 ish we went into 119 even look at that right there let's scrunch that up so you can see it like that there we are and you can see that's what I'm talking about right there even well you know in the end result it's the summer months we've got all kinds of great political uh, what's the word uh, they call it, how did it, it's not, not calamity, 
We have great physical, I hear the word in my head, I can't say it out loud. What is it? Folly, that's it, folly. Not calamity, folly. You know, I mean, the, uh, the it's going to be very interesting, this election. There's a lot of, a lot of interesting points being made. Um, I'm looking forward to this whole adventure. It's going to be really good. We may see some of the the best, uh, you know, best uh, election situation we've ever seen. Yeah, see, it won't let me write anything on the chat line. I wonder what that's all about. What is that all about? Why can't I write something on the chat line? Anyhow. That's the three currencies right there alone, not counting looking at the dollar index. You know, it for all the noise and the political dancing, and you got the G7, you know, they, they're trying to cap oil prices, I don't know. Free markets, free people. And every time you turn around, they throw some crazy idea in, in, or out there, you know, something outlandishly funny, crazy. Like as if they could pass a law to freeze oil that they don't produce. You know, I mean, Mr. Biden has done it in the United States. He has written executive orders to stop us from drilling oil for the last couple of years. And this is what we get. We get very high prices, triple, triple the price of what it was before. So it's gone up three times in value. We look like Turkey, <laughs> like the country Turkey's currency at this point when it comes to oil. We went from, we literally went from zero Oil was being given away for one day here in the United States, a barrel. Uh, it was actually going, it went to a minus where people were paying people to take the oil. That's how crazy it was here. To now it's trading in the hundreds, you know, like 110, 120, 115, 105, I don't know. What it, where's, let's see what oil is doing this morning. So these characters get together in uh, Europe to talk about you know, different economic things. Yeah, 107 there. There it is. Playing with the daily buy as we speak. Had a little volatility signal there on Friday. We're still in that weekly sell, though, now for the last uh, three weeks. Or this is starting the third week right there. You can see the last time we were in a buy from the uh, par area. Around the 120. Now we are in the weekly sell from the 118 area. And we've drifted down close. Matter of fact, I think the spot, I want to say the spot, one of the contracts, oh, I know, it was one of the back month contracts. I saw trade down into the 97, 98 area. Yeah, that's what it was. It wasn't spot. So that's where we are at the moment. And G7 thinks they've come up with some type of resolution about dealing with the problems. Can't wait to see that one go down in flames. What a joke. All right. So, back to the currencies, and let's check out the Turkish lira or the American oil market. One or the other, it's, they both look the same. Yeah, Turkish lira has definitely taken a change. Ooh, what did they announce? Did I miss an announcement? Look at that. So, towards the close of Friday, they slammed it, and it closed in a daily sell there. Cool. Did it right after uh, the U.S. markets just basically closed. And then, you know, so nobody was around, and then they're putting the pressure on it today. Now, it's a little bit higher than where, no, it's not. It's lower. They just didn't take it. They took out the low, that's all. And it is lower, too, at the same time. So, they must have come up with something in Turkey to... Um, calm things down they promise something to somebody I, I would imagine this though uh, we for some reason have missed what they promised we've not seen what they promised but one thing is for sure uh, whatever they promised right here has failed you know it brought the stuff back to almost where we were at uh, before they supposedly were giving out free puts uh, I'm I'm a little concerned that the, that since there's no talk about the free puts, um, I'm really concerned that uh, that we're missing something there. You know, in other words, they done they did something in Turkey uh, that basically scared money, 
And obviously, if you're, the government's giving you free puts, then you don't have any particular reason to be scared. But when uh, you see that type of action, it says to me that they've definitely found something, uh, you know, just, just something that would shake up the whole process. Now, you know, I keep on looking for, you know, something announced you know, someone complaining like, oh, man, we didn't get our puts. You know, they, the government is not backing the currency the way they, they were. You know, something of that nature. I keep on thinking we'll see something like that jump out. So far, we've not. We really have not seen anything at all pop out, which makes it very curious that, you know, why, why we have not seen something like that. Because it's pretty obvious that they've changed course on some level. And by not, you know, by not publishing it, uh, you know, it, it really has, uh, you know, just really shaken things up. But we'll keep on looking. Sooner or later, the, the story will pop out. The math is always the leader in the end result. And uh, that's that will be the next situation. And, ooh, I'm seeing a headline. Citadel, what did the Citadel do? Citadel pull out? So here we are. Illinois is now more equal and poorer. The political establishment. Let's see, Illinois political establishment's shameful response to the departure of Ken Griffin and Citadel. I guess he moved the Citadel out of Chicago. I can't blame him. Yeah, I keep on looking for something like that on a wall in Ken Griffin's. No, I don't hear that one. So I guess what they did is they moved. I guess that's the way it goes. Uh, you know, these uh, that's the that's the beauty of the the fifty states is that when a state does something odd or stupid, uh, they say that you know Citadel was the crown jewel of Illinois' economy. Uh, let's see, decency, proper sending off. I guess let's see. I guess the the governor even gave him a bunch of grief. <laughs> Figures. All right. So you can see Turkish lira, a euro against the Turkish lira, is taking a nice dive there. Uh, if anybody knows what the noise is or that the n indices, you want to see indices? It's, hey, you're back, Janos. Janos is back. Cool. Let's check out that. Let's go over and take a look at S and P five hundred. There we are. There it is. Here's the S&P 500. And you can see it's it's holding firm from the, the moves of last week so far. Looking okay. You know, they're just vacillating back and forth. Still one thing, though, that bothers me is that they can't get it into a weekly buy. You can see it's here. This is the th fourth week now. Starting a fourth week in a sell. Uh, obviously, you know, it's lower than where it started from. So that's cool. You know, we caught that whole move there. Uh, this was a nice bounce. Uh, I think there's good reason for some buying, you know, nibbling at the, uh, the stock indices. It makes total sense to me. Uh, we did see, let's just go over to the, the NASDAQ 100, or better known as the Tech 100. You see here, it went into the sell up in here, and it's come back to it, whereas the S&Ps did not do that. And they also found a way to get into the weekly buy last week. And here we are at the beginning of this week. And we are piercing the weekly sell already. They're putting that pressure on the product there. So the S&P 500 couldn't get into the groove. And now we see this finding a way to try to drive itself down. Now, I think the granddaddy, let's take a look at the granddaddy of them all. And there it is, the, the uh, Dow Jones Industrial Average. Had to sneeze there. So you see it went into the weekly buy last week. There we are. And so you can see the action we see right there. Uh, the And now it's doing the same thing. It's rolling over. There. There's the, uh, the you know, playing with that. But the daily looking pretty firm. You know, it's been in a buy since like right here. So there is some short-term buying going on in the stock indices. You know, money is 
nibbling away. I mean, that's the that's the whole idea too. Remember, buy low, sell high. That's the name of the game. So, they are flirting with the product product at the moment. Uh, let's see. Oh, okay. So Turkish lira. I'm seeing some news now, but I'm not seeing much. Just that their reserves says uh, Deutsche Bank uh, sees severe oh severe impact from loan ban. Okay, so Turkish ban Turkey's ban on lira loans to some firms fires up currency rally. Huh. Interesting. But we have not heard anything about the free puts that they gave out, which gave that market lots of energy. That's the only news I can find on Turkish Lira with that type of action. Maybe they see it. Maybe they see it as a, you know, very responsible, you know, situation. I don't know. You know, in other words, they've been maybe they've been lending money poorly. You know, and if they're not lending money poorly, that's a good thing. <laughs> Let's try not to throw the assets away. You know. All right. So there you go, Giannis. There is the tech, and we can do this too. Check this out. And that's the intraday. You can see here the S&P 500 down 525. We got the tech 100 down 20, and we have the down, I'm sorry, up 20. They're all up. Five, up five, five, five and a half. 18, almost 19 up, and 17 here. And as you can see, here's the Dow Jones Industrial Average. It was trading at the... 31,670 mark uh, as uh, you know starting off the in the European markets and in England and it has traded down to under 500 so that's a hundred and uh, that's pretty aggressive it's a, it's a 200 point drop so at one point the uh, Dow Jones Industrial Average this morning coming into this market was up almost 200 points Now let's take a look at the S and P 500. Same, let's scrunch it up more. So you can see it right here. There it is. You know this is uh, the European opening right here, and you can see right in there, it's come down from. I guess it was three thousand nine hundred and forty-eight something like that and we just bounced off of 3920 and just look at that number again 48 right yeah 48 so that's 28 point drop that's a big drop and the tech 100 playing the same situation there's the European open where was trading at 12,260 and now we are at 12,150 so they've they put some selling into this market as we begin the week. We'll watch it, see it, and find out if it has any meaning. Let's just take a look at them on uh, J4X. Right. Where are you? There it is. Dow 30 right there. Lifting up nice. Green line, whole bit. And then the uh, Tech 100, same situation. This is a daily chart on J4X. And then last but not least, the S&P 500, the big one. Fund managers like to, uh, you know, 500 stocks is a lot easier to uh, hunt for, you know, stock, what do they call it, uh, stock picking compared to just 30 Dow stocks. Let's see. Uh, hey, Kimbo. Da Dockler, what's up, my man? Um, What's up is fascinating, you know. There's a lot of interesting political stuff that I think will clean up the financial markets. Um, we are really excited about watching this political season. Maybe, you know, I want to see the, uh, the economy here in the States get turned around into a positive direction again. So we're really looking forward to that stuff. Uh, I'm reading ATM reminiscence of stock operator, but I get to your book, champ. Let's see. Let's go, champ. Let's go, champ. <laughs> I 
Well, you know, John Murphy's really good, and he's like a, an encyclopedia of stock market analysis, you know, technical analysis, that is. And then the other two guys have been, you know, promoted and displayed, you know, W.D. Gann and, and uh, R.N. Elliott have been displayed for decades upon decades, you know, you know, in the modern markets. So, yeah, they're, they're, they're good. And you're reading, what was it you're reading? Uh, I'm reading ATM Reminiscence of a Stock Operator. A Stock Operator, that sounds familiar. Let me see who that is. Let's see. Let me see if I can grab a home. You know, I can probably cut. Can I grab that and cut and paste it? That would be nice. Let's see. That sounds familiar. Yeah, at the moment. I, I, I It took me a little while. Trust me. <laughs> it took me a few. You know, it took me about 40 seconds to think about that. Uh, and then I realized it was at the moment. But yeah, I was... Uh, I was actually thinking, hmm, ATM, like, is it easy money? Is that what it is? There's an audio book of it, too, I see. Edwin Lefevre. God, that sounds familiar. Uh, I see free downloads and so forth. That's cool. Let me just check this out. Lefevre. That does sound familiar. Edwin Re the book follows the life story of famous Wall Street stock operators. Oh, Jesse Livermore and I see. Let's see. Let's see if we can get that <coughs> rundown again. That sounds good. Jesse Livermore was an interesting character, but those are the old days. You know, it's like you know reading uh, Shakespeare or something like that. You know, you're not going to understand. Let's see, reminiscence of stock operator is a 1923 Roman. Roman, a Cliff American author, Edwin Lefevre. It is told in the first person by a character inspired by the life of stock trader Jesse Livermore up to that point. The book remains in print. Yeah, I guess. And then when did Jesse Livermore jump out of the window? Um, he'd, he'd gone bankrupt at one point and then came back and succeeded and that type of thing. So let me just see something about Jesse Livermore. Because I remember reading something about the book. People were saying, you know, they should add to it because of um, there's no mention of uh, the later years. So let's see. I, I maybe I'm wrong about that, but let me just look it up. Let's see, Jeffy, Jeff, uh, yeah, Jesse Livermore. Uh, hey, okay, so 1940, an American stock trader. He's considered a pioneer of day trading and was, yeah, unfortunately those days are gone, you know, when it comes to his style of trading. Let's see. There it is there. Who was Jesse Livermore? Born in 19, um, 1877. He's one of the, one of the greatest traders that few people know about. Seems like, oh, it's hard to believe, but okay. Um, he wrote that book in 23. Livermore, who was author... All, what, who is the author of How to Trade in Stocks, 1940, was one of the greatest traders of all time at his peak. Livermore is worth $100 million, which is today's dollars. Yeah, Oh, yeah, definitely worth a lot of dough, right, me? Let's see. Let's see. Hi, successful. Understanding Jesse Livermore's. Yeah, see, in those days, you know, I always mention that, too. You know, that's something we talk about here, and that is... The trading, when he traded, when someone bought a stock, they were normally long or covering a short. And when they sold a stock, they were getting short or they had been long the stock and they were taking a profit or possibly a loss. But that was the only four avenues there, you know. And once 1975 came around, that that got washed away. That doesn't exist anymore. So the, the technique of his, I mean, I'm sure there's some discipline things about them that are probably worth paying attention to, you know? Now, it says, and that's curious, it says here, and a con, uh, and, and see, success becomes even more staggering when considering that the traded on, uh, 
that he traded on his own using his own funds, his own system trading. Let's see, there is no question at the time. Let's see, times have changed since Mr. Livermore traded stocks and commodities markets were thinly traded back then, I guess, compared to today. And the moves volatile. Jesse speaks of sliding major stock multiple points, which purchase of sale of a hundred, uh, you know, a thousand shares. Yeah. So, um, I'm going to have to read this a little bit more, but I really am in opposition to thinking that that was the, uh, that, that can be emulated today. That's, that's what I'm really concerned about is I don't really believe the trading of those times since the creation of listed options are, um, you know, you, I, you can't use that style, like let your profits run and all those other things, you know, in a market now that is way, way more volatile than then, way, way more volatile. And so also volume was enormously small compared to today. Uh, if I don't think the New York Stock Exchange traded a million shares a day back then even. You know, I mean, we trade, you know, the New York trades a billion a day and the NASDAQ trades four to five billion a day. So and it's and a lot of it is le it's because of the leverage of the options industry. So I find, you know, like when I was young and I was at the New York, they used to complain about us all the time. They were always complaining that the option guys had wrecked the market, and they made lots of money on low volume. And you know because they and also remember back then I think it was eighths. I'm not sure if it was even steens. Did they trade in steenths back then or just eighths? So that's $12. Can you imagine a stock that goes up or down $50 a uh, $50, 50 uh, not $50, a stock that would move 2 or 3% a year or 1% a year at best uh, with a bid and offer of $12.50 wide or even $6.25 wide? You know that 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 uh, that those days are gone. I mean, our bids and offers are penny thin, and institutionally uh, derived from just heavy volume. So, I'm um, I'm gonna have to read more of Livermore again. I you know I I I read it. I've seen the original book, but I you know I in my head, just subconsciously, my head says, don't don't pay attention to old stories more than their discipline. The discipline is always going to be important, no matter who says it. In other words, you know, if Livermore said this is what his discipline is, then you can back test it today and see if it works. Um, but those days are gone. Options and technical analysis is so much more. Reading the tape was they were reading the action. When Livermore traded, he was a tape reader which we all were on the floors because you could see the volume and the bid and who was doing it. And so that was that was then. Now we have black pools and there's all kinds of things that make it very hard to do. So that's 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 all I'm saying is just be careful about what you lean on and back test anything in modern markets because these modern markets are totally well beyond anything that was going on during the Livermore years. So I'll have to look him up a little bit more. I'm just, I could have sworn he jumped out a window. That's what's confusing me. When it says 1940, it doesn't sound like he jumped out of a window. I wonder who I was thinking about. We'll have to check that out. I could have sworn it was Livermore. Let's see. Here we go. Let me just look them up again. There you are. Let's see. Yeah, I mean, I'm seeing the same thing again. Um, Massachusetts guy. Cool. Suicide by gun. Okay. I had heard he'd lost money or something like that. You know, he'd lost his money again. And that's what did it. So, I, I just to... Uh, FYI, you know, I think it's good to learn about the discipline. And I remember reading, it was a real big thing. People tried, you know, when I first started on the floors, people were really reaching for history. We needed history to understand what was going on. Because markets were very prolific all of a sudden. Exchanges were, you know, 
there were more exchanges and more center points. You know, before that, the New York Stock Exchange was it, and the rest of the markets were almost non-existent. Cincinnati and Philadelphia, they were almost meaningless exchanges. But, um, you know, so people started looking at history, trying to understand, you know, what was going on, wanting to know if what people did in the past worked. And all we got was, no, <laughs> it wasn't working. And that's because options had changed the name of the game. You know, it made it made it a whole different style of trading because traders used to say, you know, we before options we knew when a buyer came in, more than likely there was they were a buyer. I mean they were legitimately a buyer. And now when buyers come in we don't know if they're just covering the sale of their options. We don't you know so that was that's what I'm trying to emphasize is that the the information is totally unique compared to you know Livermore's days that's all we've talked about this before so I think that that you know it's good that you you know you look at history and look at all these guys because you know WD Gann and and um, R and Elliot were really bit players in many ways WD Gann was much bigger in many ways matter of fact the marriage of, of all of them together and Jones was a fascination in its own right, and that's that, that's classic Livermore time period. Um, you know, so you know, it's just a just a FYI. That's all. Keep keep the that in mind. A lot of the techniques of Livermore now don't fit. All right. Let's see where we go from there. But always, I'm always fascinated. Whatever you come up with, you know. Let's see. On Thanksgiving Day, yeah, at 5:30 p.m., Livermore fatally shot himself with an automatic Colt pistol in the cloakroom of the Sher a hotel in Manhattan. Hmm. My dear Nina, can't help it. Can't help it. Things have been bad with me. I'm tired of fighting. Can't carry on any longer. This is the only way out. I am unworthy of your love. <laughs> oh my God, that's so funny. In a sad way, of course. Uh, I'm truly sorry about this. this. Is the only way out for me. Uh, let's see. Yeah, yeah. Well, again, you know, it it was an interesting era too. You know, think about it. You know, the the uh, teletype and the the stock ticker. You know, I mean, the electro electronics was being developed and the telephone and all that stuff at the turn of the century. Back then, I mean. I remember I, I remember reading somewhere about the gold exchange, like you know when they they put a telephones down there, boy that did that ignite the trading in in metals complex you know that type of thing it was you know good stuff, it's it's always good to look back at history and see what we can learn from it, uh, I I understand you know I remember you know I remember you know it's let me see, how do I phrase this I remember being on the floor when I was young. And there were, like, now I was like a veteran at that point. I was young, but I was a veteran. Like Robin, we were veterans. You know, we had been trading for a few years, and new people were coming in. You know, the, the era was growing. People would come in, you know, uh, some would last a week. Some would, most would last a week and disappear. Some would last, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, years because they knew better. And... Uh, you know, the one thing they were doing is they were reading all these books that you're reading now, you know, and, and uh, trying to understand the marketplace. So I think that's a very positive thing. I mean, that's smart, Kimbo, you know. That is smart. But, um, again, the real market since 1975 is the options and binary market. That's the real game right there. Because that's the one that has opened the markets to go from just a few million shares a day being traded to a few, you know, un, you know almost you know, seven, eight billion shares a day being traded. And that's that's the wild that's what it's all about really. Is understanding what is powering these these vol the volatility, the action, what makes a bid and an offer, you know, that type of thing. Not counting the crazy black uh, the blackpool situation where they're they're just trading without it being disseminated. So you're not really seeing what Livermore was living off of. And that was supply and demand by big by big traders or 
you know, retail, that type of thing. That was another thing, too. I think he followed the retail market pretty aggressively. Uh, in other words, he was following what retail was selling, and he was buying. You mean nowadays? Well, the Federal Reserve, uh, the Federal Reserve is supplying money, you know, to the to the institutions to prop up the market. They're keeping it propped up. So that's uh, you know, that's that's really what it is. And that's uh, that's that's the you know the whole design of it at this point. I mean, there's obviously private money. Also, at the same time, money has become well the mon the money supply is enormous now. Let's see. So so what's the positives of propped up market well it's good for politicians you know they can borrow more money and spend it that's that's about it for the population not really i mean you know i mean they, their assets have grown pretty dramatically which is good um i guess you know they always say if the bubble just slowly diminishes and it comes back down to the fair value area that's fine if it crashes to it that's usually painful What if the market is less propped up? Is it bad? Well, I think that what will happen is that there'll be... Look, there's a lot... It's it's not a simple yes or no because the the, the markets... The QE is for stability. And we've seen, you know, where major institutions went bankrupt and they're still around in name because they've been bought by other institutions that weren't irresponsible now you know like a Merrill Lynch or a Deutsche Bank or you know they're all gone they've been they're bankrupt basically but they still function under the under the support of their central bank or in this case of Merrill Lynch under the is owned now by Bank of America you know and so they tried to sell Deutsche Bank off dozens of times especially the commercial bank in Germany they could not get anybody to buy it it had, just has too many problems so, um, you know, Citibank here in the United States, same situation. It's basically owned by the Federal Reserve. It trades still a little above bankruptcy prices. You know, it's it's uh, all time high is like six hundred and sixty seven dollars, uh, and it trades at like fifty nine or sixty dollars or fifty five dollars a share. So that's that's pretty bad. Bankruptcy prices are. You know, usually you think in the thirty-dollar area when you come down from six hundred and sixty-seven or sixty-five, you think about thirty-dollar area for for bankruptcy. So, and the stock did trade down to two dollars a share, and then they did a reverse split. So it really went down to twenty. It's trading at sixty, and it's high all-time high is six hundred and some dollars. So you know that's pretty bad. So, uh, what if the markets are less propped up? it means that the asset value will probably drop back down and the ratios but at the same time earnings are keeping it up and uh, and all this spare cash floating around also there's nowhere else to go really I mean isn't Deutsche Bank trading at uh, can we get Deutsche Bank up on the screen I think we can get Deutsche Bank up on the screen I think it's uh, trading at uh, maybe we can get a chart it will show you the damage that's been done to some of these Let's see, Deutsche Bank. I'm going to look, see if it'll jump out at me. Are there German, there's Japanese stocks. Are there German stocks here? Look, we look under the D's here. Here comes the D's, let's see. Deutsche Bourse, Dansk, Daimler, no, I don't see anything yet, DBKDE, okay, 
D B K dot Oh there it is right there. Perfect. Yeah, so I mean Janos did this webinar trying to you know a while back about you know video about uh, fundamentals and how the trade how you can't trade fundamentals you know so freely now there's that's just daily in the last you know couple years now let's see if we go back how far back we go on a monthly Yeah, that's what I figured typing the name in. I just thought I'd try to be a little bit more conservative. Yeah, so there it is. It's it's trading like Citibank. It's reflected at you know fifty it was a fifty dollars a share. And it's gotten as low as four and a half, five. It's trading at eight now. So it's uh what is that, eighty percent? A little more than eighty or not a yeah, eighty some odd percent off its all time highs. So, I mean, it's not been able to really recoil back. Uh, there's 2008, where it goes under. And it took all the way to 2019, where a Citibank in 2008. Let's see if we can do Citibank here. Yeah, let's see if we can do this. City. There's Citibank, right? Is that Citibank? I don't think that's Citibank. That's probably one of the European banks. But the end result is, why is it so bad? Well, they they went out of business because they they did collateralized debt obligations and they invested so heavily in them. That it put them out of business like Merrill Lynch and Bear Stearns and Citibank, and but they got propped up at the same time uh, by the central banks. They, you know, Lloyd's of London and so forth. I, I mention this a lot. These things are gone. They're only in name only now. They're not the original corporations anymore. The, they, they got. They were in, some of these. Some of these banks and brokerage houses were heavily invested in collateralized debt obligations. That's what collapsed in 2008. And when they collapsed, they took down all these major names like Merrill Lynch and Bear Stearns and Lehman and uh, Wachovia. Wachovia was probably the, at some point, it might have been also, you know, it was one of those co-mingled you know they they'd merged so many brokerage houses and uh, mutual funds and uh, you know together as one big giant brokerage house and bank especially with glass steagall gone not really because the central banks now are the the backers of all these organizations so the chance of a collapse now would take like an asteroid come and hit the earth it would take something very dramatic to crush it. But money is, matter of fact, you know, let me just say this about that, okay? That's my Richard Nixon quote. And that is that um, a week ago, the Federal Reserve gave permission for all the banks to start paying dividends. Or not start, but pay, allowing them to pay dividends. They control, the central banks control pretty much all actions of the banks. The commercial and private banks now so notice that they gave permission that they could start paying dividends because they thought the banks were they gave a, an approval of the health of the banking system and what did we get we got a dead cat bounce out of that we got a nice big rally out of the stock market from it you know a good little rally i would think a real rally would have been 12 or 1400 points and uh i think it was a little shy of that i'm not sure let's take a look what did the Dow do? Let's go on to here and take a quick look from last week to this week. But the moment that they did that and they gave permission for them to start buying the stock, Dow Jones Industrial Average on the 17th right there. Let's make it bigger so you can see it. Let's 
So on the 17th, that was the Friday of the week before, right? Is that right? Yeah, that's the Friday. The Dow Jones Industrial Average closed at, uh, where did it close at? It closed at 29,869. So let's, let's call that 29.9. And today it's trading at 31.5. So that's a 1,600 point move. Now the Federal Reserve at this point right here, in those days, gave permission to JPM and all these other banks that they could start lend, they could pay their dividend because they did a bank, they do a, a bank stress test here in the States. And I think they include some of the European banks and so forth. And uh, it, and you got a big dead cat bounce. See, it's all based off of the, uh, the Federal Reserve and what they're doing. And uh, what they're doing is they're propping them up and and they're hoping this is the this is the philosophy they want them to grow out of their bad debt and i'll say this again the federal reserve is lending all this money to all these companies is because they want them to grow and earn their way out of the debt that they've created from poor decision making you know by investing in the wrong things and so you know will it collapse not necessarily Will it go down? Sure. You know, we're down almost 30 some odd percent in NASDAQ and 20 some odd percent in the Dow and I don't know, or no, is it 15 percent, 20 percent in the S&P 500 and 15 percent in the Dow. So, and now you can see they've, they're coming back pretty well. Yeah, they're supporting the corporations. Exactly. They are. They're the buyer of last resort. Not only do they do that, but they will, f they will work at creating a marriage between it was, I mean, Merrill Lynch could have just gone bankrupt. Instead, what they did is they, they found Bank of America and said, hey, give them $7 a share, and we'll lend you money for it. And that's what they did. It took a little while for Bank of America to get moving along again, but, uh, you know, they absorbed an incredible amount of debt because Merrill Lynch had, you know, buried itself. Uh, you know, and so did Bear Stearns and so forth and so on. Um, you know, they... So yeah, they're the they're the supports to these modern markets. The CDOs, the collateralized debt obligations, really crushed everything. Took out Lloyd's of London, gone. That's owned by the Exchequer. All right. So where would we leave off? Oh yes, we were looking at what were we looking at? Turkish lira. Oh, let's take a look at Canadian. Unless anybody wants to see anything, then we'll go back to it. I have no problem going back and forth. Deutsch, uh, <laughs> douche bank. Yeah, I hear you, Giannis. Look, yo, uh, let me just finish this off with uh, an interesting point, and that was that at one point, uh, Deutsche Bank had what they call uh, swaps. They had swap investments where they they take the other side of trades for customers, and they they like create over-the-counter options things like that and they had swaps they had something like something absurd like 72 trillion not billion not million they had 72 trillion in position well 72 trillion dollars trillion 72 trillion in dollar position is enormous if they do something wrong they uh, you know, if they try to unwind it before it matures, they could be in real trouble. And now their position is down to last I looked, uh, it's like 32 trillion. It's getting, you know, it's it's lost over 50 percent of its size. And what they want to do is they're going to let the swap slowly unwind down, and then you'll watch. One day they'll do one or the other. They'll they'll uh, literally merge. Commerce Bank of Germany will probably will merge with Deutsche Bank, but they're not willing to take that debt right now. And so, but that, and the Citibank's the same way. Citibank was the second biggest uh, bank on the hook for swaps. They were like two or three trillion less than Deutsche Bank. And uh, they've whittled theirs down dramatically also into the 28 or something like that trillion. Once they get underneath a trillion or two, I bet they get under like two or three trillion, they'll, they'll get merged. For Citibank, I'm not even sure what the 
Citibank will do at this point. But I know that the Germany has been trying to get somebody to buy Deutsche Bank for years. You know, you got to figure it's 85% off its all-time highs. You know, and it's like, uh, you know, you can't find anybody to buy them. just shows you what kind of internal problems they have. I hope that makes some sense to everybody. All right. Let's check out some of the other currencies, and then we'll get out of here unless anybody wants to see something. There is the Canadian right there. You see the Canadian has slipped into a cell on Friday right there. And uh, it's still in the weekly buy, though, right there. So we're not really getting um, – let's fix this, too. Uh, let's put the Canadian in there. There's the daily. Right there. So we're seeing it back off a little bit in here. That's, you know, the oil is going up. We usually look at oil. We did, we, did we look at oil today? Yeah, I guess we did. Did we look at, I'm trying to remember why we looked at, yes. I remember talking about oil. So right now there is oil. You know, it's trying to gain a little bit. Looks like it's going to push itself into daily buy. But again, we're in the weekly sell. So the Canadian is kind of drifting along here in the, uh, you know, it's gaining some value. Because uh, normally when oil goes up in value, Canadian follows it. And then over here on, let's go to gold. There's gold. And gold is, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, there's gold. And you can see it's, about unchanged, maybe up a little bit for the day. It was much, much higher before throughout the day. And still in that daily sell from here. And we are flirting with the weekly sell as we speak uh, right there. Let's just do a file save there. There we are. Let's see. Kimbo says... Have you seen South Park episode where the, where the, I say, they oh they portrayed the central bank to be making decisions like uh, bailout of a headless chicken. <laughs> I like that. That's good. Uh, running on the board and and it where where it ends, that's the decision. Oh my God! Yeah, that that sounds like that sounds real. That is, that is a great one, Giannis. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Well, look, the the central banks have basically saved uh, the world from changing dramatically, like it did in in nineteen twenties. The cocktail maker. Oh my god, that is funny. Yeah, you know they they're trying to they're trying to prop things up. And they're trying to keep stability, and that's that's their whole objective is that stability thing. They're really big on stability, and they really and they and they're making sure that the retirement funds and the, the pension funds and uh, mutual funds are trying to make sure all of them are very firm. They want them to survive. All right, traders, it's time for me to get out of here, but I think we will mention some of this as the title, like something like. Uh, Jesse Livermore, uh, you know, is uh, is he the man of these times? I don't know. I don't think so. Uh, we'll see. This is Doc from North America. Catch everybody tomorrow, same time, same channel. Happy trails to you until we meet on Tuesday. Happy trails to you. To all our Duke of Scopy trading friends, later, later, traders. <laughs>